Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. And as I said, I, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to this very much so. I do enjoy listening to Chris talk. I think if Chris talked about stripping paint, I'd listen to him. So with that, it's, it's over to you, Chris. David, thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Chris. I'm an alcoholic. It's, uh, it's really good to be here. This is, a, this is an extraordinary uh, meeting. The, the topics are all so interesting, and the people, <clears throat> the people that uh, are getting an opportunity to share are all really worth hearing. You want to you wanna deepen your understanding of Alcoholics Anonymous and the history of Alcoholics Anonymous and the history of uh, the, spirit, the spiritual uh, uh, program of recovery? This is a really cool place to be. So, so when I was asked uh, early on, uh, this is going to be two weeks in a row, you know, what, what, what do I want my topic to be? I, you know, I always just kind of go into contemplation, you know, I'm, I'm available for an intuitive thought. And I usually go with the first thing uh, that comes up. And, and, you know, my topic is going to be the mind uh, this week and, and the spirit next week. And, you know, I believe, um, I believe in the, the book Alcoholics Anonymous. I believe what it's telling me. And, and, and I believe that um, the writer, the main architect of the information in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, and an architect is somebody who assembles, who, ass- who assembles things that already exist into a unique whole. That's kind of what an architect does, right? builds builds something something from pre-existing uh materials and and bill did bill i don't think bill invented a lot i think what he did was he he put into practical application uh information that someone who was suffering from alcoholism would need to understand and then would need to do uh for recovery from alcoholism and uh, to this day I am still blown away by how intuitive the information is in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, my first exposure to it was it was kind of clanky. You you know, uh, uh, the the steel prosthetic girder and, you you know, the the safe cracker who's been wronged and all all this stuff. And it just seemed rather clunky to me with with further, uh, further study and further applying of uh, the principles and the exercises in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, I, I'm blown away by how how intuitive and how correct it all is. And in the book uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, it's pointed out that the alcoholic's problem uh, rests in their mind. The problem is really in the mind of the alcoholic. <clears throat> now, I'm going to go back in my history as an alcoholic and, and kind of share some things where, where I think, I think I, tur- I took a left-hand turn and I started to get everything wrong. Uh, and, and I, you know, I, I started to believe things that weren't true. I started to see things that weren't so. And, uh, <clears throat> and I, I think that that has a, a lot to do with, with alcohol. I was like a pre-alcoholic, all right? I was born a, a court low. You, you, you know what I mean? Like I just was because when I discovered alcohol, it seemed to, it seemed to answer a lot of my problems and it seemed to treat my emotional condition. Uh, it seemed to. So anyway, you know, I'm, I'm a young kid and, uh, and for one reason or another, I'm, I'm just, I'm just not fitting in. I'm not feeling comfortable. I'm, I'm not, I'm not getting with the program. Uh, I'm not, I'm not a, a third grader among third graders. You, you know what I mean? I'm feeling apart from, I'm feeling disconnected from, I'm not feeling in unity with, and, and I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying the best I can to, to show up and do what is expected of me, but it all feels wrong. 
You know what I mean? It all feels, it all feels wrong. It feels like, it feels like, uh, you know, I'm, you know, it, it just it doesn't make sense, but, but I know I'm going to get in trouble, you know, if I just, if I just, you know, uh, uh, drop out of school at age seven, you know, I mean, but, but, but I felt like, I felt like doing that, you know, because this, this just didn't, it wasn't working for me. Okay. All this, all the neighbors and, you know, the church and the school and, and the softball and all this stuff, none of it was working for me. And I kind of retreated into my own head. I retreated into a fantasy life. I retreated into, you know, reading comic books. And, you know, I started, I started to just separate myself from, from the pack. And, and, you know, I don't think I'm unique in, in all this. I think, I, listen, we all have our own story. We all have our own experience. Some of the things you might find that I'm sharing are common. Maybe they aren't. But I believe that my thinking, uh, my thinking started to get really, really tangled up as a as a young kid. You know, I, uh, I, I, I was you would have diagnosed me with childhood anxiety disorder. You, you know what I mean? You would have diagnosed me with with anti, uh, you know, personality uh, challenges, you know, whatever. But but I'm I'm not I'm not feeling comfortable. Uh, so there would be uh, an oral report I would have to give in school. Let's say I'm in like sixth or seventh grade now, and and I have to get up in front of the class and give an oral report. I wouldn't just cut school that day. I would I would cut school the three days after, so I would miss the makeup because I was absolutely overwhelmed with anxiety to get up in front of a class and give a report, especially because I didn't do the work. I couldn't have cared less about the work. You, you, you know, I'm not going to study. I don't study. You know, I don't do papers. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so, so you put me up in front of the class and, uh, and it's going to, it's going to be disaster and people will make fun of me and people will think I'm stupid and then I'll have to kill people. You know, it, it, all this stuff is going on in, in, in my head, you know, and it's really, really uncomfortable. Uh, and, uh, and, and somewhere around the age 13, what happens is uh, a couple of my buddies and I decide we're going to cut school and we're going to go back to my house and we're going to get drunk. It sounded like a cool thing to do. I was doing the outsider stuff at this time. I mean, I wasn't playing team sports. I was riding mini bikes. You know what I mean? I, you know, I wasn't hanging out in crowds. I was doing crimes. You, you know what I mean? Like, like I, I just, I just didn't fit in. So, so, so I start drinking uh, this Four Roses whiskey, and everything that was wrong was all of a sudden right. All of a sudden, I'm in the right place. For the first time in my life, I'm in the right place with the right people doing the right thing with my brand new best buddies. And isn't this great? This is so cool. This is so great. And, and I, it, it, it woke something up in me that, it, that had been completely asleep. And all of a sudden, I felt connected to you. All of a sudden, I felt the the complete removal of that anxiety and that self centered fear, and, all, and 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 I started to look at this. But this boo, the booze had done this. The booze had done this, right? And from that moment forward, I became preoccupied with alcohol. Listen, I overshot the mark because I'm an alcoholic. What happened was I finished my glass. I finished their glasses because they'd had enough. You know, you ever drink with people that have enough on you? You know, it's just it's annoying. But I didn't have enough. I, you know, I drank. I drank as much as I could until I went into a blackout and passed out out in a field somewhere, you know, and staggered to my feet. And I was violently ill for two days. But what, But the whole time I'm violently ill for two days, I'm thinking, I'm going to figure out how to make this 
alcohol stuff work because because what it did for me was so important so important it connected me to the divine it connected me to this planet and all of a sudden i felt like i'm in the right place at the right time now i start to become uh, you know an active alcoholic not a pre-alcoholic now i'm a real alcoholic and i start using drugs i start you you know every every day you know if you have a if you have a pill i'll you know i'll just i'll eat it and then i'll ask you what it is you know what i mean and and, uh, and, and i'm just uh, i am i am absolutely obsessed with changing the way i am perceiving reality and changing the way i feel within reality and i you know i start smoking pot and doing speed and doing lsd and downers and but always always there's a bottle of booze there there's a bottle of booze there that's there in the beginning and that's there in the end you know and because i could rely on it there was some quality control with george dickel bourbon you know there was no quality control with the crap that I was, I was buying in high school or whatever. Who knows? I remember this one guy sold me a bunch of pills. Oh, man, they're cool, man. These pills are really, oh, they'll get you messed up. And, and so I'm taking these pills and nothing has happened. I'm taking these pills and nothing's happened. I'm calling them up. I'm like, what are these? Man, you know, they're good. I do them all the time. So I end up taking like 15 of these pills. They're his father's heart medication. You know, all of a sudden, my my heart's go. Blah, 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 blah. You know, I can see it beating out of my chest. But but I'm not going to go to the hospital. I'm not going to go to the hospital. You know, they they think I was lame. You know, so I like laid down on the floor and you know survived it somehow. Beat the guy up in school the next day for nearly poisoning me. To so well, you know, all this all this stuff is going on now. Now uh, now this is abnormal. OK, the way I am living and, and the priorities that I'm putting on life is abnormal. You know, a, a normal kid would be thinking, you know, I, I probably should start getting my grades up right around now. So be, because the SAT is coming and, you know, I, I you know, I want I want to be able to get into the college of my choice. You know, that like that's what a normal high schooler is thinking. Right. I'm not thinking. I'm not thinking about that. I'm not thinking about getting into the college of my choice. I'm thinking about who has what. Who's you know who's gonna who's gonna be drinking with me? Where, where's the concert? You know where's the park? Let's go down to a park with a case of beer. You know that's what I'm thinking about. Now, the problem centers in my mind. I I have I have I have. I have become abnormal, you know, and, and I've listened, I've learned how to hide and go around the back and disappear, you know, and, and, and so, so that people don't really get a clue about everything that's going on with me because somewhere deep down inside, I know that this is, it, it's, it's criminal for one thing, the stuff that I'm doing, I'm drinking and driving and, you know, so, so now I'm part of like this underground culture of hardcore partiers, you know, and we, and we, a lot of us are sticking together. There's one of them on this meeting t tonight that I was in this underground culture with, right? But but it but it's 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 abnormal. It's it's deviant to 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 a degree to be this this type of person so so obsessed and so occupied. <clears throat> with uh with altering my reality as many times as i can because i'm uncomfortable with sobriety sobriety has now become untenable to me sobriety has now become something like doing time you know, you know what I mean? Like if I got no money and the town is dry, it's like doing time, you know, and I'm calling up every, all over the place. Hey, who, who's got what? You know, where's the party? You know, who's got money? Because sobriety is like doing time. Now, now, you know, when they say when they say the problem resides in the mind, 
you know, there's a lot that goes on with that. Okay. I kind of explained my, my situation as an active alcoholic and what's go, what's going on up here, but because of, because of the 20 years of living like that, I come into, I come into sobriety, just not having any healthy skills, not having any healthy thoughts. You know, my thoughts are tangled. Now, now, if you, if you ask me like, Chris, what's going through your head right now? If you would have asked me that, I wouldn't have told you. I wouldn't have told you because you, I'd have been afraid they'd throw and you'd throw a net over me. You know, you'd take me off to the, to the, to the bin and, you know, the, the, the psychiatrist would probably have me gassed. You know what I mean? Like, like the stuff that was going on in my head was a mess. So on any, any day, any day when I, when I would come to in the morning, I would be absolutely overwhelmed with resentment. There'd be people, places, and things I was pissed at. And I would have anxiety. I would have this this underlying terror of facing things that I needed to face. I just I just didn't want it. I just I not today. I'm calling in sick today. You know what I mean? No, I'm I'm not gonna. I'm not going to school. You know what if it doesn't work? I, I'm gonna get. You know what I mean? You you want me to go do? Say, I'm not I'm not okay with that. You know, I, I, you know. And I start my my world starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller because I'm pissed at half of it, and I'm afraid of the other half. <laughs> you know, so so I I remember I remember I'd gotten married and and I'm like this right? I gotten married and and. And, and you know you, you're supposed to like like be responsible. You're supposed to like be able to support a family and and be supportive. And you know I got a daughter by this time, and I can't go anywhere. I'm sitting at home smoking pot, getting paranoid, watching Love Boat reruns while my wife goes off to work. It's just I, I'm I'm crippled with an inability to deal. It's like a lack of of dealage. This is where this is where my mind has 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 taken me to. So I show up, I show up in sobriety, you know, with all these twisted thoughts, all the, all these crazy perceptions about how the world works and you know, like what's unfair and who's trying to get over on me and and all this stuff is going through my head. And it's, it's a mental illness. You know, I, I, I believe when I separate, I've already got it, but when I separate from alcohol, I now have a mental and emotional illness. My emotions are ill. I'm, I'm suffering from, from guilt, from shame, remorse, self-centered fear, anxiety, depression. So I've got suicidal ideation. Okay, that's that's an emotional and a mental illness. And I show up in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and and uh, and, and, and hey, Chris, you know, welcome. You want a cup of coffee? And 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 I, and I can't let you know. I can't let you know what's what's going on in my head because you'll throw a net over me and have me gas. So I got to now pretend that I'm not stark raving out of my mind, you know, and, and here's the thing. I've been stark raving out of my mind in the sober periods of time in my life for a long time. Now it's almost become normal for me. But I know deep down inside, there's something desperately wrong. There's something desperately wrong. And I remember going to AA, and you were, you were great with the suggestions. Chris, I want you to do a 90 and 90. Uh, okay. Chris, I want you to pick up the ashtrays. Uh, 
okay. Chris, I want you to put away the chairs, even if you didn't sit in them. Oh, 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 okay. Chris, I want you to get to the meeting early. Oh, okay. You know, I, I'm so desperate that um, I'm following these suggestions that make absolutely no sense to me and are not going to work for me. You know, like, 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 understand. I have a mind that wants to kill me. There's no other way to put it. I have a mind that is programmed for my destruction. The only time my mind is comfortable is five minutes before I pass out from drinking too much. You know, somewhere between drink seven and drink nine, I can do this. And that's not even working anymore. So I'm in desperate, desperate trouble. And, I, and, and here's the thing about alcoholism. Alcoholism does not allow you the dignity of an accurate self-appraisal. And, and, and I, think, I, think that's, I think that's compassionate. <laughs> You know, if I really knew how much trouble I was in, you know, and what I would have to do to recover from it, if I knew all that, like my on day one, it it would be it would be a real bleak outlook for me because I would have I would I would think there's no way I can do that. There's no way I can do that. You want you want me to join AA for good? You know what I mean? You want me to not drink forever? (laughs) You know? So, so, so I got it. I got it a piece at a time and I got it from a really, really compassionate sponsor. Now my sponsor started off like in a very, you got to understand what was going on up here. You, you know, you know what was going on in my head. He understood. He understood because he was an alcoholic too, and so he kept it very simple. He goes, "Chris, just I want you to just go to a meeting every night. Can you do that?" Yeah, and and so I started. I started to go to AA meetings instead of being out there drinking. The AA meetings were during my drinking time. So it made, you know, it made a lot of sense to, to go to an, go to a seven o'clock or an eight o'clock or a nine o'clock meeting back then. And there was little lessons that he, he would give me. Now, this is how far off the beam was. I remember he was the first guy that was inviting me over to his house. People weren't inviting me over to their house. They weren't saying, Hey, Chris, we're going away for a couple of weeks on vacation. You want, you want to watch my house? You know, they they know that they'd come back and there'd probably not be any furniture in it or something, you know. So nobody nobody was asking me to do this, but he was inviting me over to his house. And I remember uh, the first time I met his children, he had a, a son and a daughter uh, who, who were like uh, 12 and 13. And he had me break bread at the table. So it was me, my sponsor and his 12 and his 13 year old kids. And they got up afterward and they went into their room to do homework or whatever normal kids do that I didn't do. And he goes, he he was very, very kind to me. He goes, Chris, Chris, could, could I, could I ask you a favor? And I said, yes, Phil. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. He goes, could you not use the F word in front of my children? And I'm like, I'm like, Oh, Oh my God. Like every other word out of my, Here's a, here's another one. He, he goes. This was years later. He goes. He goes. Chris, remember we would drive to meetings together in the winter. I go. Yeah. He goes. Remember I'd always have my window open. And I go. Yeah. He goes. You know why I always had my window open? I go. No, Phil. Why? He goes because you would be talking like this. <laughs> and I, I'm like I'm like oh my god. I was an absolute lunatic. But I didn't think I was, you, you know, when I, when I got sober, I didn't, I didn't, I, I, I shouldn't say I didn't think I was, I didn't know how bad it was. I didn't know how bad it was. I, I remember, I remember this other time there was a, there was a, a bunch of halfway houses around where I was going to meetings. And I remember uh, this, this one newcomer girl, I got six months now, right? 
there's this one newcomer girl, this one newcomer guy, like hook up, you know, boy meets girl on AA campus and trouble soon follows. Right. And I remember, you know, she, she kicked him to the curb and he flipped out and he was literally chasing her around the church, like trying to get her. And, and somebody said something downstairs. And so I started heading up the stairs. My sponsor's coming down the stairs and I'm heading up the stairs. Right. And he goes, Chris, where are you going? Where are you going? He goes, I'm, I go, I go, what, what's his name? What's your name? What's your name? Yeah, I'm going I'm to go kill him. And he, and he goes, he goes, Chris, we don't kill people in AA. And I'm like, I'm like, you know, it was like a Yoda moment. You, you know what I mean? It was like, it, it was like an acid moment for me. Like, whoa, <laughs> you know, we don't kill people in AA. This, this is how far from reality I had gotten. This is, this, is, this is how far off the beam I had gotten. Now, I'm going to a lot of meetings, and my life is getting better like a millimeter a, a day. You know, uh, the, the things that are getting my health is getting a little better, you know, uh, I, but, but, but still within me, is all this resentment and all this anxiety and all this distance. The best way I can describe it is the distance. You know what I mean? From, from connection. And it's getting just a little bit better every single meeting I go to. And then I get exposed to some people who, uh, who give me a set of 90 minute tapes. And these tapes are, uh, are an early, like mid eighties workshop uh, by the late great Joe and Charlie, the original Joe and Charlie. And this guy, this guy lends them to me and says, "Dude, you know you're hardcore. You're, I, I didn't care much for this, but I have a feeling there's going to be something in this of value to you." And uh, and there there was uh, I, I because I got really upset with the material on those tapes. They were talking about an AA I knew nothing about. They were talking about an AA that was not being discussed in the closed-minded discussion meetings I was going to. They were talking about an experience that I had not had. I was sober, but I was a long way away from recovered and they were talking about the process that you go through to go from sober to recovered and because i'm not hearing it in meetings because i because i you know i you know i'm not i'm not really I'm not, re I'm not really okay with all this stuff. They're talking about four column inventory and, you know, putting together an amends list and going out and making amends and how you got to pray and meditate and upon awakening, you know, you, you, and all this stuff that I'm not doing and I have no experience with. My life blows up like a month after I listen to these tapes and I had no tools. I had no emotional fortitude to get through the things that, that happened. And I, I, I just, I started to go like almost into a fetal position. The emotional pain was so great. You know, it was like a second bottom that I had in, 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 uh, in AA. And there was, there was something about those tapes that haunted me. There was, Joe and Charlie spoke with uh, authority they spoke with confidence and they spoke with humility and they spoke about the nature of alcoholism and the process of recovery. And they did it with, with sheer confidence. So, so that information haunted me. I ended up going back to those tapes, taking it as a serious piece of real business you know, and, and I started to go through these tapes and I started to do what they, what they said you were supposed to do. And I blew off the, the dust off of my big book that I'd gotten in treatment. And, and I started to do a very, very imperfect, very haphazard uh, approach to actually taking the steps. And, you know, when I found out, what I found out in the steps was 
I've got a mind that's really resentful. Okay. David, what did you say? What did you say? What did you mean by that? I know what you meant by that. You know, I mean, that's where my mind would go, like, like out of the blue. And what, what the fourth step asks me to do right out of the gate is it asks me to inventory my anger and my resentment. The things that I'm holding on, the being pissed off at people, principles, or institutions that I'm hanging on to. The, because my mind won't let me let this go. If, if you ripped me off on a drug deal, 10 years later, I'd be slashing your tires if I found you. I wouldn't let any of this stuff go. So the exercise is, the exercise is, is to inventory this stuff to inventory it, to see, to see where these resentments are, are, are corroding my, my thought processes, corroding the, 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 my experience with other people, other places and other institutions and other principles. It, my relationship with all this stuff has been corroded because of the, these resentments. And I start to see the truth in them. And I start to change the way I think. It asks me to change the way I think. We deal with these people as we would sick people. These people are not coming at you. They're doing what they do. And you are perceiving. You're perceiving things incorrectly. You should be looking at these people like sick people with compassion and trying to see how you can be helpful. Now, that's a jump from wanting to slash their tires to, to, to trying to be compassionate and understanding. But the process in the book Alcoholics Anonymous is simple enough that if I follow the instructions, I begin to make that jump from, from wanting to get revenge. And my thinking starts to change. Okay, I'm really, I told you, I'm really anxious and I'm really uncomfortable. And, and you know, I just, I just don't, I, you know, I, I just, I, I just don't feel like, like being, being here, here right now. You know, I'm just, I think, I think I'm going to go, you know, that anxiety. The second thing they asked me to inventory is my fears or my anxiety. You know, fear is an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of my existence is shot through with it. It creates changes, of circumstances that just put me in a position to be hosed every single time. It's a direct quote, David. So, so these fears, these fears are ruining any quality of life because I'm just, I just don't want to, I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, you guys go without me. You know what I mean? They asked me to look at this. They asked me to look at these fears. They asked me to identify them. They asked me to, to the question, why do I have them? And then there's a then there's a prayer. And then there's a process. And then they they get me to start change my change my thinking about all these things. That don't I have this fear and don't I have this anxiety because I'm relying upon myself all the time. I'm, you know, I'm not the best person to rely on. You know, don't rely on me for anything. Yet I'm relying on myself for everything. And it's, it starts to change the way I think about my reality. And all of a sudden, I start to outgrow this fear. I start to, I start to outgrow my anxiety. And I start to be able to show up. Show up comfortably where I'm supposed to be, doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And this is, this is a, a fundamental change within my mind because my anxiety comes from my mind. My resentments come from my mind. And then it asks me to look at my relationships. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but people let me down 
Did people let you down? <laughs> did you change friends a lot? <laughs> did you cut people out of your life? Did you stop taking phone calls from people? Did you stop talking to people? Did you quit jobs because of the boss? You know, did you move to other towns <laughs> because of the way it is in this town? Well, I was incapable of being the type of person who could be in a healthy relationship. You got to remember, I've got a mind that wants to kill me. And there's collateral damage everywhere. There's collateral damage everywhere when you have a mind like mine. Because I'm seeing everything wrong. I'm perceiving everything wrong. So, I get, so I've got these relationships where people were foolish enough to, to buy into my facade and get into a relationship, whether it was a friendship or whether it was intimate. And very soon they would recognize the enormity of their mistake and they would, they would exit themselves or I would get resentment and I would kick them to the curb. And this happened over and over and over and over again. I could not develop any meaningful relationships. I couldn't develop any of them. I had rendered myself permanently single, you know, without even knowing it. You know what I mean? So this inventory, it asks me to review the relationships I've been in. And there's nine questions. You know, where did I, you know, did I unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? Who did I hurt? You know, there's a number of questions that I need to ask, and I need to look at every single relationship, and I need to answer these questions. And all of a sudden, my thinking starts to change. And I start to recognize that my problems aren't coming at me. They're coming from me. My mind had created all of these situations because I had a bad manual you know my my owner's manual was really bad and and i you know i i was inappropriate every way you could be inappropriate and then it asks me to develop an ideal an ideal for a relationship and it you know i can you can use this on intimate relationships you can use it for friends you can use it as as a, a an employee ideal a family ideal whatever but to put together the characteristics of a good relationship, then there's a process where, where repeatedly I ask God to help me grow and to help me become the type. I've, I've now got a goal to help me become the type of person who can be in relationships, who can be in friendships, who can be in a family, who can, who can stick it out at a job. and. All of these simple exercises have changed the way I perceive reality. They've changed the way I think about things. And all of a sudden, mentally, um, I'm becoming more healthy. With that, emotionally, I'm becoming more healthy. You know, because I'm acting appropriately, I'm not in shame anymore about how inappropriate I was, you know, now that I'm not pissed off at everybody, you know, I'm, I'm able to be in a long-term uh, friendship or relationship with somebody. And my thinking is, is changing. Uh, does alcoholism, uh, does the main aspect of alcoholism reside in my mind? I believe it does believe it does and, and and i believe you know I'm, next week i'm going to be talking about the the movement from the 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 mental health piece into the spiritual and emotional health piece which i believe goes from six step six to step step 12 i believe is what healed me emotionally and spiritually but at least i'm thinking correctly now at least i understand who the problem is it basically says in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, self, in the in the various manifestations, uh, uh, is what had defeated me. I had defeated myself because of how I thought. 
You know, I love the set aside prayer. Uh, I love the set aside prayer. Uh, I believe my home group was the first home group in the world to start using that prayer. We started using it in 1997 in Murrinsville. And it, and you, you can't shake a stick without hitting a meeting that uses uh, the set aside prayer now. But I believe so much in this prayer. Help me set aside what I think about something, what I believe about something, my opinion about something. Help me set that aside. Not throw it away, but set it aside so that there's room for me to be open to a new perspective, to a new understanding of something. Because you know what, folks? I could be wrong. <laughs> the hardest thing for an alcoholic to ever admit, I was, I, I, I was wrong. <laughs> I know today that I could be wrong. And you know what's cool about being wrong? The, the right is usually better than the wrong I had. So I'm cool with being wrong today. But anyway, you know, have I been restored to some form of mental health? Uh, absolutely. Do I still have quirks? Does my wife still think I'm crazy? Yeah. <laughs> You know, because because there's there's still a lot of progress. There's still a lot of progress, still a lot of work I got to do. You know, sometimes I rest on my laurels. Sometimes I sit on my ass. There's more work to do. There's more work to do to grow in understanding. And with the understanding, I grow in in effectiveness. And uh, and you know, you know what? Uh, I am I'm absolutely done, guys, with uh, with the presentation. I love being across the pond. You're all my friends. I love all of you. And uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it back to David. That's fantastic. Thank you, Chris. Um, so with that, Chris, again, because it's been a great pleasure to turn me over you. David, thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Chris, and I'm an alcoholic. It's good to see some of my friends here, uh, Alan, Howard. <laughs> um, uh, it's always it's always good to have uh, have some uh, some power. You know, just a little bit about what's happened between uh, uh, this week and last. Uh, last week, I, I, I spoke on the mind, and I'll recap that a little bit. But you know, I want to tell uh, I want to tell a, a story. I get I get a lot of uh, phone calls from sponsors. I get a lot of ten steps. You know, from from people they need to run something by me, and. Uh, and I get a, I get this beautiful call. This guy's working a great program, uh, and he calls me up and he's he's sharing with me that you know he fixes stuff around the house. And he's got some really young kids, and young kids break stuff. And and he you know he walked in, uh, he walked into the house the other day, and there was a curtain rod that was bent down like a U, like somebody like tried to shimmy up the, the curtain or whatever. And, and he, he said he blew up. He got, he, he got crazy. And, you know, uh, then, then he got quiet and it was, it was my turn to share. And I basically shared with him uh, that uh, I've, uh, I've just moved and there's 13 workers in the house. And how about having no doors in the house? How about, because they're in the garage being painted. How about having no doors on your bathroom? You, you know, I'll take that curtain rod, <laughs> you know, so, so, uh, uh, it is, it's absolutely wonderful how we're able to share with each other and how we're, how we're able to, you know, help each other walk this road. Of, of recovery and the support that we, that we give each other. And it, there's always a, a synergy. You know, there's always, there's always something that we, there's experience, strength and hope that we can share with people when we get into, into fellowship with them and into communication with them. Now, uh, that being said, last week, uh, I talked about mind. Uh, the problem of alcoholism rests in our mind. Uh, I believe the problem is the mind. Now, there's many ways that I can make the case that the mind is our problem, but how about the obsession of the mind? You know, that's part of step one. What is the obsession of the mind? The obsession of the mind is the sheer inner, uh, a sheer utter inability 
to stay separated from alcohol, even knowing it's it's absolutely in our best interest to do so. You know, we're the type of people who make solemn promises and we mean it. You know, this time I'm not going to do it again. I swear I'm not going to do it again. Uh, What's in my hand? Oh, (laughs) it's vodka. (laughs) You know, I mean, and, and, and we don't even understand it. If somebody asks us what, you know, didn't you just get your third DUI and and you just you just drove over to my house with a with a case of a beer and you know fourteen of them empty? You, you, what, what's wrong with you? Has anybody ever asked you that? What's wrong with you? Yeah, and uh, and and we don't know how to answer that. We don't know how to answer that. So, so there's something there's something deep within our mind. That if we could get a hold of, if we could have control over that, we might be able to make a decision to stay separated from alcohol and have that mean something. So that's one area of the mind that's the problem. You know, uh, last week I went into some of the other areas. We, you know, resentment. We we allow resentment to just chew us up emotionally. We we allow self centered fear to divert us from doing what we need to do, being where we need to be, you know, helping the people we need to help, becoming the type of people we really need to become. We allow self-centered fear to shut us off from that. And then I don't know any, any class of person that suffers more with guilt, shame, guilt, shame, and remorse than the alcoholic. You know, we suffer from guilt, shame, and remorse so much that modern addictive illness treatment has become shame-based in its in its application of the therapeutics that they use with us. The, the professionals are convinced our alcoholism is driven by our shame. I'm not so convinced of that, but I will tell you this. I had some guilt, I had some shame, and I had some remorse. So all this emotional, all this emotional uncomfortability, it is it, it rests it rests in my mind. Whole package of alcoholism. It's the whole package of alcoholism. This is what I come to you with. I come I come stumbling into Alcoholics Anonymous with just a basket case of emotions, not able to control my emotional nature, just ready to freak out on you, you know, for, for some perceived reason. You took my chair. I was sitting there, you know, I mean, just completely, just, just no guardrails, no filter, no governor. I'm just, I'm a lunatic. And I'm even more of a lunatic in my mind. If you knew what was going through my mind, you would throw a net over me and have me gassed. If you really knew what I was thinking, you know, so I believe that the mind is the real problem with that. Bottles are a symbol, but yeah, the vodka and the bourbon didn't help much, you know, uh, cause a lot of trouble. But why did I drink it? Knowing what I know about what alcohol does to me and and the problems alcohol causes me, why do I keep putting it in my body? So so that's that's the mind. All right. I show up in Alcoholics Now and I start working a program based on separation from alcohol. It's an abstinence-based program. That I start running. I start running my program, right? I'm going, I'm going to one discussion meeting after another. I'm going to beginners meetings. I'm going, I'm going to some speaker meetings. There's even the occasional step meeting I'm throwing in there. But I'm convinced that what Alcoholics Anonymous is giving me is every single day, it's reminding me not to get drunk. I thought that was the whole point. I thought that was the whole point of AA, that we all get together and we all, the the first drink gets you drunk and, you know, keep it simple and and, and first
first things first and and upside down three think three times and you, you know and, and i'll see you back here tomorrow and don't take a drink even if your ass falls up and i'll see you back here tomorrow you know and yeah you know like like aa was this this insane pep rally trying to convince me on a daily basis not to put alcohol in my body and one day i'm i'm on the way to an aa meeting and the thought crosses my mind that I should buy a gallon of vodka and drink it. And guess what I did on the way to the AA meeting? I bought a gallon of vodka and I drank it. And it blew my world up for seven more months. Now, now, now I come back to Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm working the same program. It's based on abstinence because I don't know any better. All right. I don't know any. Yeah, I see the steps up on the wall. Uh, you know, they're kind of rudimentary and, you know, they're kind of dated. And I agree with them in theory, you, you know, but but my case is different. I, you know, there's got there's got to be a there's got to be like a different form of recovery for somebody as deeply complicated as me. You know, this is what's going on in my head. But I'm, I start going to meetings. I, I'm going to 12 14 meetings a week. I get a sponsor. I'm, do, I'm doing service work. You know, I'm a secretary over here. I'm a treasurer over there. I'm driving the boobies to the hatch, you know, uh, from the local treatment centers. And, and, and if you didn't have any money, but you were hungry, I'd take you out to the diner after the meeting and I'd buy you dinner. I, you know, I'm all in to this Alcoholics Anonymous thing. The problem is, is my mind is still still tangled. It's the best way that I can describe what was going on in my mind. My mind was tangled. All the thoughts. I was desperately attached to the past and the future. So how the past, how the past affected me, my emotional and spiritual state was, I regretted so many things that I did. I had the guilt. I had the shame. I had the remorse. I can't believe I did that yesterday. That was so stupid. I can't believe I'm so stupid. You know, you know what I mean? Like that kind of stuff is going through my head constantly. And tomorrow, tomorrow, oh, oh my God, tom tomorrow, tomorrow, I, you know, tomorrow, I know what they're going to do. I know what they're going to, they're going to say this and then I'm going to have to say that. And it's just, it's just gonna, it's gonna be, a, it's, damn it, uh, tomorrow's gonna suck, you know? And, and so, so this is, uh, and I'm sober going to 12, 14 meetings a week. And my mind is just trying to kill me. Now, I read the big book. I read the step book. And I'm gaining a little bit of intellectual understanding about what the recovery program is, is basically asking me to do. Yet I remain unconvinced it will be necessary for me. Now, you know what kills alcoholics more than anything else? Looking at the recovery program and saying to yourself, I'm not convinced that's going to be necessary in my case. The four step, the amends, the prayer and meditation, the sponsoring other people. I'm not convinced that that's going to be necessary. So what happens? What happens? So somebody hands me a set of Joe and Charlie tapes and what, what they did was, they laid out the spiritual mechanics of the 12 steps. What do you actually need to do? And if you actually do this stuff, you will then be able to say that you took the steps. And I'm still, even after listening to Joe and Charlie, I'm still saying to myself, you know, I get all that 1939 stuff. I get it. But I'm just, I just remain unconvinced that it's going to be necessary for men. 
what happens is my life blows up. My life blows to shreds. Okay, it's it, it's it's an absolute nightmare. I, you know, I, a state is coming after me because I fled to avoid prosecution. You know, a relationship that I I got in. You know, I, I met this girl on the druggy buggy at my home group. You know, the treatment center was dropping her off. You know, and, and we, you know, within a couple of months we're dating. And you know, what could go wrong? You know, with that. And and uh, and, and then I lose my job. I lose my job. So so all this stuff, all this stuff that one of those things would have been a challenge in an unrecovered state with untreated alcoholism. One of those would have been a challenge. And I'll tell you right now, going to a lot of meetings and not drinking is not the treatment for alcoholism. Bill and Bob and all those guys knew that from the beginning. They knew that abstinence was not the treatment for alcoholism. Abstinence was a necessary part of the recovery process, but it of itself was not sufficient for the recovery of alcoholism because alcoholism is my tangled thoughts. Alcoholism is my resentment. Alcoholism is my self-centered fear. Alcoholism is my character defects and my defective relationships. That's what alcoholism is. And the pain of living a life with all of those things opens the door to alcohol for me. Because alcohol is an escape. Somewhere between drink seven and drink nine, you know what I do? I do this. And I exhale the whole way. Do you understand what I'm talking about? If you're an alcoholic, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You could be like, oh, tomorrow's going to be terrible. I can't believe I'll uh, drink eight. How the hell with all that, you know? I, I, I could care less about all that, you know, because it, it, would, it, would, it would escape me from the bondage of self. Now, now I, I, I get put in the barrel, these three things happen, and, and I get to a sober jumping off point. It talks about in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, you, you know, we're going to get to a jumping off point where we, we, we can't imagine life with alcohol, we can't imagine life without alcohol, and we're just going to wish for the end. You know, we're just, we just want it all to stop. We don't want to feel bad anymore. You know what I mean? We don't want to feel bad anymore. And because I had just been exposed to those Joe and Charlie tapes, I put them back in the cassette player and I started listening to them because I thought maybe, just maybe, if I took these steps, they would address the real pain in my life. And I started to do that. And guess what? The moment I put pen to paper was step four. The moment I shared my inventory with my sponsor, the moment I put an amends list together, the moment I started to actually go out and make amends, what happened was my spirit healed. All right. All right so so sp- sp- the spiritual awakening is the treatment for alcoholism. And it's really hard to understand that prior to experiencing it. We all have to stumble into this stuff, you know. It's usually the grace of God and coincidence and good sponsorship and a decent home group that we that we're able to stumble into this stuff. Because how do you know what you don't know? Now, now, uh, many many years. It's many many years later now. And uh, because of the spiritual experience that I had, because I started to see that spiritual growth was not only not only beneficial to the recovery from alcoholism, but it brought me great comfort. So I started to read just an absolute ton of spiritual literature. I've got two bookcases right next to me, just just filled with stuff. Now. Now here's here's basically here's basically what uh, 
what I learned. I, I started to study the mystics, the Christian mystics. These are the desert fathers, they call them, right? These are these are the aesthetics who renounced everything and went out into the desert to seek a profound experience and understanding of God. And that these are the, every every religious tradition has these mystics. There's 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 Muslim mystics, there's Hindu mystics, there's a Buddh, Buddhist mystics. And what these people all have in common is an absolute desperate desire to fill within them a spiritual vacancy that can only be filled with God. Okay, that's what these mystics are. And I start studying these mystics and I start to realize, I start to realize that what an alcoholic is, is an alcoholic is an unresolved mystic. We have a spiritual vacancy within us that we try to fill with all kinds of stuff. We Alcohol especially, alcohol especially at periods of time, gets us in touch with the divine, get, gives us some relief and some comfort from this, this vacancy, this just not feeling comfortable with myself and my environment. And then I get sober and I start to, I continue to try to fill that vacancy with other things. They call it in the big book, sprees. Well, a spray is not necessarily just an alcoholic spray. A spray can be a sex spray or a spending spray or a gambling spray or a drug spray. You know, what happens, what happens is sobriety becomes untenable because of this spiritual vacancy. And what I found in the 12 steps is a holistic answer to the fulfillment of this emptiness that's inside me, that separates me from the divine, that separates me from God. And that's what the 12 steps do. That I believe, I believe every single one of us is as connected to God right now as we ever will be. The connection is there. The problem is, is there's interference in the, that's, that's causing, causing all kinds of distortion in that connection. And that distortion is basically coming from the tangled thoughts. It's coming from the resentments. It's coming from the self-centered fear. It's coming from the shame. It's coming from feeling like I am all on my own here. You know, I'm all on my own here, and th and this just isn't going to work. And that's what that's what creates the dissonance in the connection. In the twelve steps is this: I believe, I I believe the first five steps treat our mind, treat the thoughts, treat the tangled thoughts. That, that create such disturbance in our emotional and our spiritual condition. And then we get to step six. And step six basically says, are you willing to have God remove these defects of character, these shortcomings, the things that are blocking you off from a real quality of life? The things that are going on in your head that are causing you your misfortune and your failure at life. Are you willing? Yes, I'm willing. Okay, then humbly, humbly ask God to remove those shortcomings. Humbly, I believe, means something like this. God, I can't, you know, if, if, if I could have changed I'd have done it by now. If I could have overcome these character defects, I'd have done it by now. These things are too big for me. They're as big as my alcoholism, these defects of character. Will you please help me with them? It's like, it's like, it would be like going to a parent and saying, Dad, you know, I, I'm just, I'm a screwed up kid and, and, and I'm messing up and I'm doing things that I'm, I'm not proud of. Would, would you help me be a better kid? You know what I mean? 
Like what father wouldn't sit down and say, yeah, you're damn right. I'll help you be a better kid. Let's, you know, let's talk about this. So our heavenly father is just waiting for us to say this. I, I truly believe it. And then the next step, the next step is, I believe it has a lot to do with our guilt, our shame, and our remorse, especially our shame. We, we list the people and the institutions that our character defects have, co have caused us to cause harm to. All right, our sense of selfishness, our our sense of uh, of self centeredness. You know, what we go out there and and, and we we rob and pillage and lie and cheat and divert and don't show up and do all that stuff, right? I need to put together a list of the people and the institutions that my character defects of harm, and then. I need to go and I need to make direct amends to those people and in those institutions. Why? I remember I was giving a talk. This is 20 some years ago. I'm giving a talk at Rutgers School of Alcohol Studies. It's one of the, one of the preeminent places where all the research and the professors, and, you know, they're, stu they're studying us. We never see them, you know, or hear about it, but they're studying us, right? And I'm giving a talk there to a bunch of people who are going to become counselors. Before you, you got to do this summer school thing before you become a CDAC or, or whatever. And then you all of a sudden you get the piece of paper and you can go out and you can counsel alcoholics. But you have to do this, this summer thing. And somebody brought me in and I, and I gave a talk on the efficacy of the 12 steps. The efficacy meaning... Me, me, meaning, you know, the applicability, the, the, uh, you know, how well, you know, the 12 steps works on alcoholism. And I, I blew through the steps and that was my talk. And somebody came, you know, I'm trying to leave and somebody, one of these counselor, pre counselors or whatever, follows me out in the hallway. He won't let me go. And he's going, what about shame? What about shame? Right. And I'm like, finally, I just stop and I say, okay, let me, can I ask you a couple of questions? And he goes, sure. I go, well, ha have you ever fully conceded to your innermost self that you're powerless? And he goes, no. I go, well, then you probably didn't come to believe that there's a power greater than yourself that can solve your problem. And he goes, no. And I go, I go, well, then you, you probably didn't make a decision to gain access to that power, did you? And he goes, no. And I go, and then you didn't really put together an inventory of, you know, resentments, fears, and, and harms uh, and, and do that self-examination, did you? And, and he goes, no. And I go, well, then you probably weren't able to share that with somebody if you never did it, right? And he goes, no. And I go, then you probably never became willing to have God remove the defects of character that you have. And he goes, no. And I go, then you probably didn't humbly ask him to. And he goes, no, and I go, you probably also didn't put together a list of the people and institutions that you've harmed, right? And become willing to make amends to them. And he goes, no. And I go, obviously, you never went out and made amends to the people and the institutions that you've harmed, did you? And he goes, no. I go, then how the hell do you know that you can't deal with shame with the steps? You, you know, you've never, you never... You never tried. <laughs> There's so many people that want to have an opinion based on an experience they've never had. You know, I'm not interested in opinions, but, and you know, what's the, what's the difference? What's the, what's the difference? I used to go to the step meeting and there was a lawyer in there. I love this guy. He was like the most unrecovered lawyer in the world. And it would be the ninth step and he'd raise his hand. He'd, he'd do something like this. Like, well, I haven't done this step formally but I'm going to share for the next five minutes on what I think this step means. <laughs> you, you know, like, like, shut up. How about, how about, how about shutting up until you've actually gone out and made amends? And then, then you can talk to us about your experience. Opinions kill people. You know what I mean? Our experience, our experience, our good experience and our bad experience helps other people. I did this and this happened, you know, good or bad. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience. Oh, I think that you should tell the IRS to go pound. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, have you ever dealt with the IRS? No, but uh, I, I tell them to go pound. 
<laughs> you know, like, like, come on, share your experience. So, so in step six, you know, we, we, we become willing to have God remove the defects of character. In step seven, we humbly ask God. Then we go out and we repair the wreckage. You can have no inner peace until you've done everything that you can do to set right the wrong. Remember, we're, we're looking, we're looking for some peace from our mind. You know, we're looking for some peace. So then we move into step 10, step, step 10 and step 11 have marvelous, marvelous, very rudimentary, very, you know, very, very simple spiritual exercises for us to do. And the spiritual life is not a complicated life. The spiritual life is a Forrest Gump kind of a life. You understand what I mean? It, 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 it's simple. We, we, we overly complicate it in our head. But if we actually do the things that they ask us to do in step 10 and 11, we start to gain some real spiritual horsepower. We really do. Things, things start to do this. You know, the, the, the level of intensity of life starts to do this. And we start to gain access. We start to gain access to the spirit. And the spirit fills the vacancy. The spirit fills the alcoholic vacancy. And the problem becomes removed. We're not fighting alcohol anymore. We're not just not drinking, even if our ass falls off anymore. The, it's not. It's not an. It's a non-issue. It's a non-issue. What we what we need to do is we need to focus on the spiritual life. We need to focus on the exercises in ten and eleven to gain access to 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 dissipate the. Dis the, to dissipate the disturbance in our connection to God, to bring down, to, to bring down the dissonance. Like, I, I don't know about it. I don't know about anybody else, but when I grew up, well, we had our TV set was about the size of a refrigerator with a screen about this big. It was all tubes and everything, right? It had, a, it had a wire that went up into the attic to a TV aerial antenna. This antenna was like 25 feet long and it was up in the attic. And, you know, you'd, you'd go from channel seven to channel 11 and it would be crap. The picture would be all crappy, right? Somebody would have to go up in the attic while you, while you were down at the TV and turn the TV aerial. And you get sometimes, sometimes uh, the signal would be coming from Newark. Sometimes it would be coming from the Empire State Building. And you had to get the antenna right or the picture was all fuzzy. Okay. That's the way my mind is. I do this work with 10 and 11 and it brings me into spiritual focus. And spiritual focus is about comfort and it's about quality. And it's about confidence and it's about courage. It's about being able to be the person who can do what they need to be doing when they need to be doing it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and then the brass ring is step 12. Step 12 is, is the cherry on top of all of it as far as the healing of the spirit. Step 12 is I go out and I start to help other people. I'll tell you right now, you want to learn something? You want to really learn the steps? Teach them. Right, Howard? <laughs> teach them. You want to really learn something? Teach it. And what happens, and, and now you start to help people. And people, people are saying, Chris, man, you really helped me. And, oh, my God, you helped me get through that so much. And my sponsor, Chris, blah, 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 right? Now you're, you're actually contributing not only to your own quality of life, but to the quality of life of the community, of the fellowship. And that's the cherry on top as far as healing the spirit spirituality is 
is is is what I need to concentrate on today. Listen, I'm I'm never going to be perfect. I'm never going to be Mister Spiritual because because there's default settings that are so ingrained, and I get pissed off, and I say things I shouldn't say, and you know I get upset with my wife, or, or you know you know there's no there's no there's no door handles on the bathroom door. There's no doors. <laughs> You know, I, I, I'm not immune to that type of stuff, but but I've got a 10 step. I, you know, I've got an 11 step. I can immediately recognize tangled thoughts, tangled, <laughs> tangled thoughts. You know, I'm going in the wrong direction here. And and I can steer back. I can steer back toward toward the spirit. And over the course of the years, this has become so important to me. You want, you want to know how much I love life. I can't tell you how, how much I enjoy my life. Today, today, I, I am, I am a self-aware biological entity on this wonderful planet called Earth in this wonderful solar system in a, ginormous Milky Way galaxy in a in a sea of galaxies out there in the in the universe I'm, I'm insignificant as far as far as my my molecular structure and my size and everything but but I'm self-aware I'm self-aware I, I I know what's going on you know I know what's going on today my thoughts are not tangled. I appreciate everything that needs to be appreciated. I love everything that needs to be loved. And I do the least amount of harm that I can possibly do. And with that, I believe that's recovery from alcoholism. I just do. So that's my talk on the spirit, David. That's my talk on the spirit, Patrick. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.